it's now two minutes past 10. And I would like to um, start this uh, webinar uh, about the um, regional Japan, Japan's and Sweden's um, energy policies, the, the regions that uh, Japan and Sweden are in and the, uh, the advanced ec economies that we are, the similar challenges that we are facing and uh, hopefully also the similar or uh, same uh, solutions that we can find in order to satisfy our um, energy needs uh, without destroying our planet. We have two uh, <clears throat> distinguished scholars and, and, and presenters today. One is Professor Thomas Koberger, who is a professor of, uh, at the Chalmers University of Technology, but he's also chair of the uh, executive board of Renewable Energy Institute in, in, in Tokyo, Japan. We also have Mr. Anders Oltrov, who is the director of the Intelligence Watch, and he's also a board member of the uh, recently um, launched uh, Japan House Scandinavia. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone and uh, if uh, everyone is, is comfortable with, with Swedish, I would uh, uh, switch to Swedish. No, we would all switch to Swedish, but I suppose that there are maybe a few who uh, would like, who would prefer uh, us using the English language. Um, if I could just ask the uh, participants uh, to raise the hand if you need us to speak in English. Otherwise, we will switch to Swedish or have some kind of mixture going to sound. And, okay, there is a hand. <laughs> okay. Uh, we would like to uh, welcome uh, the, 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 the distinguished person behind the hand and welcome him to this uh, webinar, uh, which means that we will do it in English. So with these words, I would like to um, give the mic to uh, uh, Anders Oltrov to begin uh, a, a presentation and uh, our discussions. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to start with um... Japan and Scandinavia as advanced economies and why they should pay uh, more attention to each other. And then I will speak about one area of special common interest. And finally, I will say some words about what we can do to enhance collaboration between the two regions. So let's start with uh, the economies and uh, the populations. Japan, as you know, is the third largest economy with 126 million inhabitants. That is well known. Less known in Japan is that Scandinavia is together, uh, if we include Finland, uh, bigger than Spain and uh, similar in size to South Korea and Russia in terms of GDP. Uh, Japan and European Union has uh, concluded um, a very big free trade uh, area uh, economic partnership agreement and that's entered into force two years ago and is the largest economic uh, zone in the world with 635 million inhabitants and 30% of the world's GDP. They have also made a strategic partnership and a green alliance. That okay. means that they have... Um, Can I just interrupt and say that we have some signals saying that um, it is not possible to see the presentation. So I wonder if you could uh, try to switch uh, slide. Uh, maybe in... maybe we should switch to Sumas in this case and I, um, I send uh, my presentation to uh, Emilia. Yeah, do that. Uh, so we switch to Thomas and I uh, yes. start later. Yeah. OK, all right, uh, we'll do that. Um, we uh, hand over the mic to uh, uh, Thomas, who will begin his presentation as soon as. I will see if I'm more successful. You see my yeah. slide now? Yes, I think so. 
So I had uh, hoped that I would be after Anders, and uh, what I would like to describe is what is happening in the Japanese energy industry and the energy policy and compare that somehow to, to the Swedish situation. And first of all, it's uh, very relevant that Japan and Sweden has one fundamental characteristic in common regarding energy supply, and that is that both Sweden and Japan lacks fossil fuel resources. So in the 19th century, uh, or even the 20th century, when fossil fuels was the dominant source of energy in the world, both Sweden and Japan could be considered to be energy poor. On the other hand, one advantage for Sweden that we developed, especially during the two world wars, when we were cut off from the supply of fossil fuels, was the development of hydropower. And Sweden has a lot more of hydropower resources than Japan has, which has created a, a relatively good condition for Swedish energy supply compared to Japan. But both Sweden and Japan uh, significant development of nuclear energy in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, Sweden has more nuclear power per inhabitant, but Japan has more nuclear reactors. And uh, while Sweden officially changed its policy objectives on nuclear around 1980 after a referendum, the Japanese policy continued to be one of developing nuclear power as a major source of energy. Uh, that strategy started to fail already in the 1990s because of economic and technical difficulties with nuclear power. So the, the year when nuclear power contributed the largest number of terawatt hour, and that's most energy, but also the largest share of Japanese electricity supply was already in 1998. Since then, there have been uh, significant technical problems, safety issues that has limited the uh, uh, generation and stopped the increase on nuclear power. But then in, um, in 2011 came the event that created uh, a real shakeup of the Japanese energy policy and energy development. And that, that was the, the three core melts and significant leaking of radioactive pollution from the Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear power plant. It followed the great uh, Japanese earthquake and the tsunami wave that hit this nuclear uh, power plant after the earthquake. Uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of uncertainties regarding to what extent already the earthquake damaged, especially reactor number one, but definitely the tsunami wave uh, by cutting power supply created the, the, the uh, events that, that led to these core melts. In Japan uh, at the time, we had a very rare situation in that the prime minister at the time, Naoto Kan, was actually an engineer with some natural science education. So he actually understood what was happening while he described that most of the people around him lacked the understanding of what a nuclear power plant really was and, and could not really understand the, the, the potential com consequences. He did uh, call on the uh, chairman of the Atomic Energy uh, Forum, I think it was called in Japan, and they had a meeting where they realized that if the winds turned uh, towards Tokyo, uh, the consequences would be such that, that you would have to try to evacuate Tokyo. And that was impossible. And, and Naoto Kan describes that as uh, a spine-chilling thought that that uh, would happen. But Japan was extremely ha uh, lucky in that winds were taking the uh, radioactivity out at sea. So very little of the radioactivity that leaked actually ended up on the Tokyo land. 
Some people believe that that the earthquake stopped all the nuclear reactors and and, and that that was the end of it. But uh, the decision making in Japan is um, in one way different from Sweden. My interpretation, at least, is that while in Sweden as a manager, you have to take a decision when that is expected from you and it's accepted that you sometimes take the wrong decision. but inability to take a decision is something considered bad. In Japan, it seems to be the other way around, that not taking a decision is never too bad, taking a wrong decision is terrible. So uh, if you look at how the nuclear reactors were shut down after the accident, uh, a lot of them were indeed shut down by the earthquake itself that, that uh, uh, triggered uh, scrams, immediate shutdowns. But then the remaining reactors that kept operating after the accidents, they had to shut down for, for reasons of changing fuel or repairing minor technical problems in the plant. And what happened in the following year was that no one dared to take the decision to let them reopen. So we had a situation that I hope you can see in a slide now where nuclear power, as you can see uh, in the middle of the diagram, peaked in 1998. There were some uh, significant drops on the way, but then after 2011, the uh, nuclear generation dropped significantly. As a result of the uh, nuclear reactors falling out of electricity generation, the fossil fueled power plants in Japan were used uh, as much as possible in 2011, 2012. But since then, uh, fossil fuel based electricity generation has dropped, and instead, what has increased is renewable electricity. The increase in renewable electricity uh, was accelerated by a very generous feed-in tariff system. And the generosity in setting the tariffs for this feed-in uh, uh, of, of renewable electricity has become a problem because those who develop these renewable energy uh, systems in Japan were accustomed, became accustomed to very generous feed-in tariffs and there are a lot of obstacles uh, in Japan, uh, legal and resistance from the power companies that has made renewable electricity appear relatively expensive in Japan. I think there are no other countries where uh, wind and, and, and solar are as expensive in, as in Japan if you look compared to other countries, and that is for reasons of legislative barriers and uh, uh, power companies uh, providing difficulties and the electricity market being uh, organized so that the uh, incumbent established power companies have a lot of control of uh, balancing power and are also allowed to actually curtail renewable installations under some conditions without paying any compensation. But still renewables have increased, fossil fuel based electricity generation has decreased, some of the nuclear reactors have been reopened, even though uh, we had one year with zero nuclear power in Japan and last year the uh, nuclear generation again dropped. The economy in Japan has continued to develop, though there are very special financial situations in Japan with long period of very low interest rates and government debt that is uh, now second to none in relation to GDP after Japan passed Zimbabwe, I think it was in 2014 or so. So the, the Japanese government has a higher debt compared to GDP than any other country. But carbon dioxide emissions have decreased uh, for uh, the reason that energy efficiency became more relevant after the Fukushima accident uh, and the economy has continued to become less electricity and energy intensive. So we now have lower fossil fuel uh, uh, sourced carbon dioxide emissions in Japan than any time before, since 1990 and already since a couple of years lower than 2010 before the Fukushima accident. 
A difference between Japan and Sweden is that Japan has not been so good at developing wind power, but has, on the other hand, been extremely good at developing solar electricity. Uh, if you go back 20 years, Japan was when one of the pioneers in developing solar PV technologies around the turn of the century, a position that then has been taken over by Germany, if you look at deployment, and lately by China, if you especially both in deployment, but also when it comes to the industrial capacity of providing the components for solar electricity. Uh, but Japan is still among the top three countries in the world in installed capacity. And as you see here, solar electricity is now bigger than hydropower in Japan, while in Sweden it's about, uh, well, maybe 50, uh, 60, 70 times more hydropower than solar. The development after the accident has been one where fossil fuel-based electricity has decreased, a few nuclear reactors have been restarted and renewable electricity has increased. So if we look at the share of electricity generation, as you see in this diagram, uh, renewables have developed successfully. And this development can be compared to the target set by the Japanese government for 2030. Uh, and that target was that renewables should be 22 to 24% of electricity supply nuclear should be 20 to 22 percent and the rest could be fossil fuel. Uh, as you see here, the renewable target was all almost reached already in 2020, 10 years ahead of schedule. Uh, the idea of restarting and developing nuclear was very far from reached. So there is now a proposal for a new target for, for 2030 whereby uh, renewables would increase significantly and the old target for nuclear is still there. Whether this will be reached or not is um, difficult to, to say for certain, of course, but it seems very unlikely that the nuclear target will be reached because that would involve restarting reactors that have now not operated for 10 years and that's extremely different, difficult as any uh, production engineer in the audience will, will, will uh, understand. So uh, reaching the nuclear target is very unlikely. It's also economically uh, very odd that they try to reach this target. Uh, and I will try to explain uh, what I believe is the reason why the target is kept. The Japanese electric power companies are regional monopolies. And as regional monopolies in electricity generation, they have for a long time been very popular among investors who have sought a low return but high security investment opportunities. Typically pension funds, insurance companies and uh, uh, banks, of course. So the Japanese power companies are highly indebted uh, and that has reduced their cost of capital. Uh, but now, when a lot of the assets in their balance sheets uh, comprises nuclear reactors, if you would say that these nuclear reactors should not continue to operate, they would have to remove them from their uh, assets in the balance sheet. And many of them would then be bankrupt under a European criteria of balance sheets uh, uh, not matching. There was an article uh, published by Reuters uh, a couple of years ago, which uh, claimed that the net assets of the electric power companies in Japan was lower than the asset value of nuclear fuels in their balance sheets. And then nuclear fuel assets in Japan includes spent nuclear fuel, something that by every other country in the world is considered to be a liability because these spent fuel is high, highly radioactive, long-lived nuclear waste that will have to be uh, put in, in permanent uh, deposits. But in Japan, they still have the official policy that spent nuclear fuel should be reprocessed. And as such, it is considered to be an asset. 
So if you would decide to shut down these reactors permanently, you would have to remove them from the balance sheets. You would have to set aside money for managing spent nuclear fuel and uh, decommissioning and, and tearing down the reactors. And that is not possible with the balance sheets of the electric power companies. And then if they went bankrupt, they would bring with them pension funds and banks, and the Japanese government would have to start rescuing these pension funds and banks. And that's something they don't want to do. So the idea now seems to be to delay these uh, official decisions as long as possible to make it possible to deflate the balance sheets uh, in a slow, controlled manner. Uh, Back to a more technical issue. Uh, Japan is not rich in hydropower, but what they did develop in the period when they uh, wanted to have uh, nuclear power as a dominating source of electricity was pumped hydropower plants. And the need for pumped hydro plants in Japan was seen as the result of stably producing nuclear reactors making up the majority of the supply of electricity while demand varies over the day and over the seasons and to solve that you would use these pumped hydro power plants to pump up water in the middle of the night when demand was low and the nuclear reactors were still operating and then the pumped hydro plants would produce electricity in the middle of the day when demand was as at its highest. That was the purpose, but what we now see is that these um, pumped hydropower plants are used in just the opposite way, or almost just the opposite way. And that's because in some parts of Japan, you now have so much solar power that in the middle of the day, power generation not only meet the peak demand, but they're also producing more than they actually need in the middle of the day. And as a result, you use these pumped hydropower plants to pump in the middle of the day and then to produce electricity in the evenings and in the mornings before the sun rises. So that's uh, an unpredicted but uh, very valuable opportunity uh, of the pumped hydropower plants that have been built in Japan. Japan has more pumped hydropower than any other country in the world. Uh, comparing Japan and Sweden regarding development of wind power is enjoyable in the sense that uh, there has been a bit of a competition over the years. And as I've been in contact with people in the energy area in Japan for, for a long time, I enjoyed uh, making these annual comparisons where Sweden was ahead in the late 1990s. And then Japan overtook Sweden in the early years of, of this century. And then um, uh, while I was director general of the energy agency in Sweden, Sweden actually overtook Japan again. And then as Sweden has over had overtaken Japan, I, I changed teams and started working with renewable energy in Japan. And you can see the Japanese curve bending upwards, but Sweden still going way ahead in installed wind power capacity. And this diagram becomes um, even more entertaining for a Swede if you change the scale from installed power to installed power per inhabitant, because then you see Sweden being way ahead of Japan. This is uh, in Japan not something that is caused by lack of resources. Japan has wonderful wind energy resources, especially on Hokkaido, where onshore wind power can produce with capacity factors uh, at the same level as uh, you need to go offshore in other parts of the world. But uh, the power companies definitely do not like wind power in Japan and have put up a lot of special regulations and rules for wind power developers that makes it very difficult to, 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 to utilize wind power. There are also very tedious permission processes that, that have delayed the development. And this is uh, really sad for Japan because the wind power potential is enormous. They are now considering uh, developing offshore wind power at a reasonable scale, which would contribute to reaching the targets uh, that they have set, not only to reach um, 30, 40% by, by 2030, but also to 
reach sufficient renewable electricity supply in order to become carbon neutral by 2050, which is now also uh, the official target in Japan. Uh, so uh, there are similarities between Scandinavia and Japan. There are also significant differences and uh, in this area uh, differences are always an opportunity for cooperation as long as you have some basic understanding that makes it possible to cooperate. And my experience after 10 years uh, part-time in Japan is that uh, there are great opportunities in the way that uh, uh, we are acting socially uh, and it is uh, uh, relatively easy for, for Scandinavians to interact with Japanese. We are humble and um, uh, deal with these cultural differences in, in a more sensible way than many other uh, Westerners, especially Australians and, and Americans. Uh, but we must also acknowledge that Japan is very special. It is, it's an island country where they are very much focused on Japan and less interested in the rest of the world. And that has been uh, become more uh, intense in the last few years. Uh, the number of Japanese students going abroad has decreased. In fact, the number of children uh, in Japan has decreased. The number of students has decreased and the share of these students who go abroad has decreased at the same time. And this is really now a problem for the uh, internationally active industries and companies in Japan that they have so few people who are both educated and knowledgeable about what the industry is really doing and at the same time have the language skills and the international experience necessary to inter interact internationally. So uh, th this is one of the issues in Japan, uh, catching up and utilizing international experience in, in, in for example, the renewable energy field. Uh, but uh, the opportunities for for Scandinavia and Sweden to, to, to work with Japan in the energy field is significant. The nuclear experience uh, of Japan is one where we may learn in Sweden uh, from their bad experience of uh, not so good company cultures in the nuclear energy area and also the uh, uh, catastrophes that that has caused, uh, but we may also contribute with our better planning regarding nuclear waste, for example, which is already an area of cooperation between between Sweden and, and Japan. Uh, but the opportunities from both the basic similarities and these differences in experience are significant. I think that is where I should stop. Thank you very, very much, uh, Thomas, for a, a fantastic presentation um, with uh, many alarming figures in a way. Uh, it's uh, also quite early in the morning still, and it's. I would say that this is a wake-up call. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, very, very good to uh, take part of your uh, information and I, I um, thank you so much. I'm sure there are a lot of questions, uh, but uh, first we will um, uh, hand the mic over to Anders Olshov, uh, who I hope now has, together with Amelia, managed to um, uh, learn how to or, or manage the, the presentation techniques. So we'll give it a try, Anders. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Good luck. We'll see. Emilia, do you have the pictures? I think good. I think you're are you able to see them now? Yep. Okay. So the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh so we go to picture one. I have to ask Emilia to change or this is the first page yes um 
So this is more uh, an economic view. Um, and uh, I will start with the market size. Um, Japan is well known uh, as the third largest economy in the world. 126 million inhabitants, five times larger than the Scandinavian countries together with Finland. Uh, and I want to stress that this is quite known in Sweden, but I think in Japan it's not very known that Scandinavia is equal in size uh, to South Korea and, um, and, and the other neighbor, Russia, in terms of GDP, and larger than Spain. So um, I think that we a little underestimate is each other, but especially Japan underestimate the potential in Sweden and Scandinavia. And then the next. Uh, uh, very interesting is also that Japan and uh, the European Union uh, meet uh, a new competition in the world, on the global arena, from both the United States, but especially from China. And because of this, they have to cooperate more than before. And they have created some very important uh, agreements, and that the big one is the economic partnership agreement, which creates a free trade area, um, entered into size two years ago. Uh, it is the world's largest market with 635 million inhabitants and, and almost 30% of the world GDP. There is also a strategic partnership and a green alliance. Um, and Sweden and, and Scandinavia as members of the European Union uh, is important for Japan in this uh, respect. Uh, next. This is a map uh, and uh, this shows the advanced regions of uh, the world. It is um, colored uh, with the dark blue and, and dark green as uh, the highest GDP per capita. And you see that United States, Australia, and the Scandinavian countries and Ireland, Sweden is dark green, almost blue, in fact, and um, is also part of uh, the world's richest economies. And in Asia, you see that Japan is the only um, dark green country. So um, these are very advanced regions, and, and because of this, they can also cooperate and learn from each other more. Next. You can see this in, 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 in different respects, but one in, interesting is that the European Patent Office, they measure the uh, fourth industrial revolution and the patents made from each um, city. And Tokyo, not very surprising, is number two in the world after Seoul. San Jose, California is number three and Osaka is number four. And there are very uh, technological companies, uh, very big ones in uh, in these two cities. They are of course very big in size and uh, uh, the smaller cities in Scandinavia cannot compete in size and, and numbers, but anyhow, uh, Stockholm is number 18 in, in the world, Helsinki the 25th and, and Malmö Lund is 26th. So uh, if you compare in size, uh, Malmö Lund is uh, one of the smallest uh, regions in the world um, on this list of the 30 largest uh, 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 for IR clusters. Um, next one. And uh, the European Commission, they also measure the innovation leaders in uh, the European Union. And you can see that Scandinavia is in the top. Stockholm number one in 20, 2021. Uh, the map here shows 2020. Uh, Helsinki number two, Copenhagen number four, Malmö Lund number nine, uh, West Sweden with Gothenburg number 11, and Oslo uh, 17. So this shows that Japan should also um, be aware of this, that uh, Scandinavia is really in the top as innovators in in, uh, in Europe and in the world. And um, we should be better in marketing ourselves also uh, towards Japan and show this for them. And I think we are not uh, very successful. Uh, next one.
uh, and this is the same uh, as the uh, former uh, page, but uh, as a map. And here you can see the innovation leaders uh, as the darkest blue and dark green is uh, also strong innovators. And in fact, Europe have like two centers uh, for uh, innovation in, in um, and you can see it going from London through Paris, Brussels, Amsterdam, and down to the next uh, center in the east is Munich. And it's called uh, the blue banana sometimes. Um, but there is another banana in that it goes from uh, Helsinki northeast towards Stockholm, towards Gothenburg, down to uh, the Öresund region with Malmö, Lund and Copenhagen. It's uh, really an interesting uh, map showing where innovation takes form. Next one. Uh, some years ago, it was in fact 2009, I, I measured uh, the global headquarters and I took the list of uh, Forbes 2000 and the 603 very com uh, global companies. There are some uh, which are more domestic, but in the global industries. Um, and then uh, I found the, the headquarters per million inhabitants. And uh, from this, you could see that Sweden has uh, the second most global headquarters per per inhabitants with 1.5. Uh, Japan is number five, Finland seven, Denmark nine, and Norway 11. Again, it shows that Japan and the Scandinavian countries, Nordic countries, are very strong economically. Uh, and then again, I stress that we underestimate each other. Um, you can also see this um, within cities. And uh, again, Tokyo is a large city and it's the world leader in global headquarters with, in fact, 12.4% before New York. Uh, but it's almost um, double the size as New York. And then Osaka number seven, Stockholm number eight. Uh, and, and that is, again, really strong for both the Tokyo, uh, Japan cities and, and uh, that Stockholm can be number eight in the world as a quite small city in a quite small country. Yes, next. Now I go to an area where I think uh, Japan and, and Sweden has um, uh, competitive advantage uh, and that is physics and material science. Both countries and regions uh, put a great effort to uh, be the leader there. And um, Japan has uh, a little longer history in, in physics and material science as they opened their research centers before. Uh, but uh, when you see the Nobel Prize winners from 2000, um, you see that Japan have won, has, have won 2002, 2008, 2014 and 2015 extremely strong results and that it's it's a lot about neutrinos and these very po uh, small part particles um, and and um, and Sweden is trying as the later uh, pictures will show to um, do the same and become much stronger in this so next uh, a little about the Japanese research centers. Uh, J Park is um, since about 12 years, 13 years, um, a number two in the world uh, after Oak Bridge uh, in um, what is called a proton accelerator, which is in examining neutrons, spallations. Um, and this is important because of Sweden they opened the, the number third. Uh, Japan has also a synchrotron radiation uh, research center. This is comparable to Max lab. And in addition, they have a free electron losers. Um, so they have, in fact, all that you need. Um, and um, because of this, they have also uh, many researchers and um, could have um, 
been able to achieve these Nobel Prize winners. Next. And, and Sweden uh, and Europe is trying to do the same. Um, we have in, in uh, the Swedish government together with European partners have opened an, an uh, facility similar to JPARC and that is ESS in Lund. It is an investment of uh, about 2.5 billion uh, euro. Uh, it is number three in the world. Only the US and Japan have uh, been able to uh, create such a facility uh, before. And we get help uh, both from uh, European partners, but also from Japan in constructing this ESS. Uh, MaxLab is a synchrotone uh, facility that is more, uh, it's more, um, less expensive. And because of this, there are more such uh, facilities in the world. Um, and we don't have a free electron laser here, but we have both a synchrotone radiation um, facility in Hamburg and a free electron laser there. So quite interesting also for the future with the femoral belt bridge or uh, um, tunnel, I mean, uh, that we get closer to Hamburg and, and uh, the facilities there. Yes, next. And here we have an area where Sweden and Japan cooperate. Uh, that is uh, between J Park and ESS. I, I've been myself uh, at J Park, uh, northeast of Tokyo, to see the facility there. And there are a lot of international researchers, as there will be uh, and are in uh, at ESS, and they help each other to um, to make progress in um, science. Uh, and um, we have a partnership between uh, JPARC and ESS. And we also got a lot of instruments from uh, Japan and other European partners in, in the construction. So they were very helpful. And uh, these are uh, facilities which develops uh, from time. And um, they um, compete and cooperate and uh, make progress and uh, get new even more advanced instruments so they can research even better uh, in material science and even smaller particles. Really interesting, microcosmos. Next. Uh, my last um, points will be about the um, cooperation, how we can enhance that between Skåne, where I'm based, and Sweden, and Scandinavia, and Japan. And I wrote a report about the potential and where we are in uh, November 2019 called Affairs for Business, or Business Relations between Skåne and Japan. I, um, I was motivated by the European-Japan partnerships, but also I saw <clears throat> um, that we have more Japanese relations than with any other country apart from our neighbors, Denmark, Germany and Jap uh, Poland. Uh, so Japan is very important for um, the Skåne region. And I want to mention why. So um, go to the next slide. Um, one thing is that the Malmö Harbor is an uh, import harbor for Scandinavia of Japanese cars, uh, with uh, more than 200,000 cars entering each year, Toyota especially, and distributed in Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, and even Baltic countries and Russia. Uh, the World Maritime University is the only United Nations agency in um, Sweden, and that is financed, based in Malmö, and financed to 20% from Japan, the Nippon Foundation. Next. In Lund, uh, you have 3,000 persons employed by Sony and Canon in uh, the subsidiaries. Axis and uh, Sony, uh, part of Sony uh, Europe. 
Um, Mitter Reich of Canon has been uh, in Lund several times, uh, especially Sony has had uh, a big exchange of uh, workers, uh, employees uh, traveling and working in Lund or in Tokyo, Japan. Um, it's not the case for Axis, which is more an independent subsidiary of Canon. Um, yeah, in in the, the report, I made a proposal to create a, an association and a, a Japanese house in uh, Malmo as a Scandinavian hub to enhance the cooperation uh, between Scandinavia and Japan. And in April this year, we uh, successfully established an association. We now have a board, we have a web page and working groups. It's still in an early stage, but we are working with this goal to um, make a platform and um, and success um, successively enhance the cooperation between Japan and Scandinavia. So. Um, we have a, a job objective of a house also based in, in Malmö, but that's only a part of the bigger idea that we will work uh, with other, um, other actors uh, working with Japan and Scandinavia, both nationally and um, um, private actors uh, to, to uh, increase the interest and the knowledge of each other. So I think we will be part of a larger structure and um, find each other in doing this successfully. And uh, we have teamed up with uh, ISDP as one of the uh, um, yeah, instruments to, to achieve uh, this uh, um, partnership and um, interest for uh, Japan in Scandinavia. So with this um, la last uh, page, I, I con conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, very informative, uh, very interesting and very promising, I think. And as Anders mentioned, uh, in fact, this is the, the first uh, in, a, in hopefully in a series of uh, webinars that uh, ISDP, the Stockholm Japan Center at ISDP and the Japan House Scandinavia will arrange. Um, uh, I apologize in the beginning for the some technical issues, but that we will uh, improve and we will hopefully not have them in the next. <laughs> but uh, regardless, I think both presentations were very informative, very interesting, and I'm sure that there are some questions. If you have any questions, you could perhaps post them <clears throat> in the chat function. Uh, and uh, before we see any questions, may I ask um, uh, Thomas a, a question regarding, uh, related to what, what you said about the, the, the thinking in, in large corporations. There is something called OIST, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, uh, that was established, um, I think, in Okinawa because it's far away from Tokyo, and also because and the 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 philosophy of that institute or, or university is that uh, at least half of the researchers must be foreigners, and uh, the language uh, should be English. Uh, do you see this as as a, a promising sign uh, that uh, Japanese decision makers are? realizing their own weaknesses and what they have to do? And do you see that there's any prospects of quickly uh, changing the the uh, business philosophy, the, the corporate philosophy and, and the government philosophies? It seems that uh, you are of the opinion uh, that they have to change. It would be interesting to hear your, your voice on that. I think that uh... They need to develop their thinking and we need to develop our thinking and, and openness and willingness to, to, to confront other ideas are important if you, is important if you're going to, to succeed in that. And I, 
I know that there are many people in Japan who have this uh, ambition, uh, but there are also many who don't. And uh, uh, we saw the battle regarding the uh, leadership in the Liberal Democratic Party over the last few days as a very interesting illustration of how, how that can work where uh, Taro Kono, who is educated in the US and who has a more progressive agenda, was uh, popular and got the majority of the votes among the regional representatives uh, when the election process went on, while the uh, establishment uh, of the party within the, 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 the members of the Diet uh, and so on voted instead of uh, instead for for the uh, chairmanship going to uh, Fumio Kishida, who is more, as as I understand it at least, more of the conservative uh, category. Uh, so, so you have in Japan these different cultures uh, and ambitions competing, and, and it's very obvious at this moment. But uh, as I said, uh, in, the, in the energy sector, uh, Technology beats both culture and politics, uh, and, and the technological industrial development in the rest of the world will will uh, force Japan to, to 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 modernize the energy supply. So it will happen. It's just a matter of with what speed and efficiency it will happen. Mm. What one often hears the the um, we're representatives from from uh, diplomats, not least from Iceland, saying that. Uh, why don't you use uh, thermal energy more in in japan yeah and uh, they also point to the fact that uh, in iceland they're using this thermal energy and they're using japanese technology <laughs> so why not uh, it, we, we said well on, at my uh, one of my first <clears throat> dinners in japan with wind energy uh, people some 10 years ago I was sitting next to a gentleman uh, who was uh, uh, one of the, the people really keen on wind power in Japan. And he had one or two wind power plants uh, that he had invested in in Japan, but uh, uh, more than 20 in Sweden. Hmm. And, and I think we see this in many industries that in Japan there are uh, companies and conglomerates and financial institutions who are extremely good at making profitable investments in modern technology abroad. But uh, in some parts of, of the Japanese industry, it's very difficult to do the same things in Japan. Mm -hmm. so, so, Anders, do you see that <clears throat> this is something that will influence uh, the, the relationship between the Skorne region, the, the Scandinavian region, and Japan, that there are some, some, some walls that we have to break through in when it comes to philosophy, business philosophies and, and corporate philosophies. Or do, do, you, do you see that uh, these are small impediments and, and uh, the real issue really is that we are quite similar and quite um, uh, ready to, to talk to each other? Well, I think there are impediments, and, and uh, but also um, reasons to talk to each other. And uh, but we build, must build structures in, in in order to do it and and spread knowledge. So it it's, it will not come from itself. I think I think the terminology of breaking walls is not appropriate. Uh, that's definitely not what you should do. I think what you should do is is get to understand uh, the reasons why they do what they do and why they do it in the way they do. Uh, and that's a terribly time consuming process. But when you start understanding, it's much easier. And it, it, I have found it difficult working at a distance. But I realized that with the people that I have been meeting uh, on a weekly or almost daily basis in the last 12 months, if I had not got to know them by, by uh, spending so much time as I have over the last 10 years in Japan, it would have been impossible. Uh, it's not only a matter of, of, of skills in speaking English, it's also a matter of, of the Japanese 
attitude, what they say and what they do not say, and how you can understand uh, what they mean when they don't say what they mean. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very significant cultural difference. And you can't communicate by breaking down walls. You have to communicate by having very big ears and listening and let it take the time it needs. Good point. So it's perhaps just a, 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 a matter of going through the doors. <laughs> <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Anyway, I think there we haven't. Well, there's one question, perhaps. Uh, no, I think that was a, a message that the person had to leave. Um, time is up. Uh, I would like to thank both of you for for very interesting presentations. Um, I hope that we can see more of you uh, in the screen in the future. And I thank also the participants for listening to this. I apologize again for the technical issues in the beginning. And I uh, uh, ask you to look at the websites of the uh, Japan House Scandinavia and ISTP for, for more information about coming uh, events. So thank you all very much and see you soon again. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.